This video is once again sponsored by Manda Sleep. Honestly, what better sponsor for an ASMR video than a company who literally provide products to help you get an amazing night's sleep. Manda Sleep provide amazing sleep masks and sleep accessories, whether it be the standard Manda Sleep Mask or the Manda Sleep Mask Pro. They have so many great products to truly help you get the best possible night's sleep. This Manda Sleep Mask Pro lets literally no light in and is so, so comfortable. So if you want to try out some Manda Sleep Mask products for yourself, then go to the link in the description or go to mandasleep.com and use the code allsorts10 for 10% off. That's mandasleep.com allsorts10 for 10% off your purchase. Thank you so much to Manda Sleep for sponsoring this video and thank you guys very much for watching. Hey everybody and welcome to another ASMR video here on the channel. Now today as you can obviously tell we have the return of the Reddit scary stories. There is something just so intriguing about whispering and listening to scary stories that try and relax and go to sleep like the the sort of juxtaposition there is kind of insane but i don't know about you guys but i for one absolutely love listening to scary stories whispered in asmr format and that is exactly what we have for you today i have one two three four five scary stories from the no sleep reddit which is again ironic because obviously Sleep is encouraged, but if you're relaxed and entertained, then we'll take that as a as a positive as well. But I reckon, without further ado, let's get into story number one. Story number one is titled "There's Something Imitating My Six-Year-Old Son." I thought you had him. I thought you had him. I glanced around the room, my heart pounding. Danny, I called. Danny, where are you? Silence. Calm down, he's around here somewhere. Our house wasn't even that big, yet somehow our six-year-old was always disappearing. Sometimes I'd find him in one of the lower kitchen cabinets. Camping, he called it, pretending the cabinet was his tent, and one of his fake fire lanterns was the campfire. Other times I'd find him hiding in the closet, opening all his boxes of old toys and too small clothing, throwing it all over the place just because. Okay, you search upstairs, I'll search down. Danny, I shouted. Geez, relax, he's probably just playing with his Lego or hiding in the closet again. Or drowning himself in the bathtub. My husband sighed, then started up the stairs. I went into full mum panic mode. I ran over to the to the family room. Empty. Kitchen. Empty. Then. F. There he was. Through the sliding glass door, I could see him. He was in the yard. Or at least, I saw his fake fire lantern. It bobbed up and down at the far end of the backyard, all the way down by the tree line. How did he get down there so quickly? I threw the door open. Danny, I shouted, get back here right now. The lantern stilled, hanging just a few feet over the soft grass. I couldn't quite make out his small form, his little hand clutched over the lantern's handle. Danny! He didn't move. Damn it. I burst out of the house barefoot. My feet slid over the cold, wet grass. Danny. As I started gaining on him, he started moving. The lantern bobbed with each of his little steps, getting further away from me. Going into the woods. Danny. Miranda. I skipped to a stop. Turned around. 
children in the area, and a quick search brought up nothing in the woods either. Are you sure it was a kid? they had asked, and honestly I couldn't tell them I was sure. It was a dark, moonless night. I'd only assumed it was because of the lantern. So I forgot about it for a few days, but then on Thursday night, I woke up around 2am to be, and when I glanced out the window, there it was, hovering just about 10 feet from our back door. Kevin, Kevin, wake up, I said, shaking him. There's someone out there. I threw on my clothes and poked my head into Danny's room. Then I crept down the stairs and my heart was pounding in my chest. Kevin followed behind. But when we got to the kitchen, the lantern light was no longer so close. It was about halfway down our backyard near the garden. It's back. That's what I was telling the police about, I whispered. I watched as it floated in the darkness, just a few feet above the ground, absolutely still, like it was waiting, waiting for me to follow it. Should we call the police, I whispered. Kevin gave a sigh, and even though he didn't say anything, I knew exactly what it meant. You're overreacting again. This feels like a prank, he said. Some kid stealing our lanterns and taunting us. It doesn't feel that way to me, I said. What if it's a lost kid? The cop said there weren't any missing kids in the area. He cut me off. He reached for the door. I'll just go out there and tell them off. You can't go out there. Why not? It's just a kid. I bit my lip as he slipped the door open and walked out into the night. I watched his shadow walk into the yard, then stop. Hey you, he called out. I'm going to call your parents and tell them you're out here. Silence. You hear me? Get out of here. The light bobbed. And then it started coming towards him. My blood turned to ice. I wrenched the door open. Kevin, Kevin, get in here. For a moment he hesitated, and then he turned around and ran as fast as he could. As soon as he got inside, he slid the door closed with all his might, locked it, yanked the string to make the blinds cover it. It, it it's not a kid. My breath caught in my throat. I immediately imagined some horrible monster, some golem-like creature crawling around our yard with our lantern. But what my husband said was far, far worse. It's a man, he said, barely able to catch his breath. His wide eyes locked on mine and I could see the terror in them. It's a man walking around on all fours. That was, there's something imitating my six-year-old son. Pretty good, actually. Pretty scary. There is something... <clears throat> Why is there something so inherently creepy about people running around on all fours? <laughs> it's usually girls with, like, the long black hair covering their face, but that was a pretty good one, I have to say. Let's move on to number two. There's something strange following my husband around. I didn't notice it until I moved into his house about a year ago. I've been married to my husband Jack for around six months and things have only gotten stranger. At first I thought he was crazy, as much as it hurts me to admit that. He always woke up in the middle of the night claiming there was something in the room with us. He'd cover up the mirrors in the house and he'd constantly check behind him whenever he walked anywhere. Whenever I told him that I couldn't see anything, he'd tell me that was a good thing. It can't hurt you if you can't see it, he would say. Then I started seeing it do. It started one night after we had eaten dinner. We were still 
sitting at the dinner table, too lazy to get up. Jack had said something offhand about the news, and I looked up from my phone to respond to him. There it was, in the reflection from the window behind him, what looked like the zombie of a woman, flesh falling off and face mangled, standing directly behind him, her partially decomposed hand on his shoulder. I jumped back and let out a small gasp, quickly trying to compose myself. What's wrong? Jack asked. You didn't... you didn't see anything, did you? He looked concerned. It can't hurt you if you can't see it, I remembered. No, I said. Didn't see a thing. Then I started seeing it. More and more. I never saw it in person, only through reflections. In the mirrors, whenever Jack forgot to cover them. In the water, when I tried to have a bath. In the shiny metal dishes, when I was cleaning them. Maybe it was stress, I told myself. Things had been great with Jack lately, admittedly. He had been wanting to have a kid for a while, and kept begging me to have one with him. I told him I wasn't ready, but he never listened. Maybe I was just seeing things. But then again, why would Jack be seeing it too? Could two people be seeing the same hallucinations? Jack had been getting more and more paranoid, I had noticed. I tried to go down into the basement, which I had never actually been down to before, to look for a screwdriver I needed. Jack had stopped me. No. He shouted desperately. Please, please stay out of there. He grabbed my wrist, pulling me back. I... I don't want it to hurt you too. Please, darling, I'm only trying to protect you. Do you trust me? He looked me in the eyes and I realised even if we fought, even if he was super paranoid, that all he wanted to do was protect me. Yes, with all my heart, I said. Good. Now promise me you'll never go down there for your own good, he said, pulling me into a hug. I promise. I thought that would be the end of it. I thought that if I patched up my relationship with Jack, that things would go back to normal. They didn't. I still saw it even more than before. At least once a day, that horrid, rotting corpse would be in reflections, staring at me, staring at Jack. Anything. One day, it all came to a head. It was night and Jack wasn't home. I was getting ready for bed. When I saw it in the mirror, usually if I looked away and then looked back, it would go away. But this time, it didn't work. What do you want? I asked, not expecting a response. Avenge me, it responded in a raspy, broken voice. I stepped back. W what do you mean? The basement. Go down and find the truth. Set me free, it said. And why should I do that? laughed. I was just like you, you know, blinded by love. Go into the basement, see who he really is. It suddenly disappeared. Cautiously, I stepped down the stairs leading into the basement, armed with a kitchen knife. I found a box in the very corner of it, and I opened it hoping it was just a box of Jack's childhood possessions or maybe a collection of baseball cards. I was wrong. Documents, thousands of documents and personal belongings spilled out of the box. Arthur MacDonald. Jack's real name was Arthur MacDonald. A man who was apparently guilty of first degree murder. And apparently, he was also legally dead. Jack, I said in disbelief, you, you couldn't, oh, he could. A boy suddenly said, 
scaring me half to death. A small one mirror in the box helped thing. It was staring at me. Go ahead, read the other documents, darling. It said laughing. She was Michelle MacDonald, Arthur's wife who he had brutally murdered. I really thought he loved me, you know, Michelle said sadly, but all he wanted was a child, another heir to his family name. I was a fool. You weren't a fool, I said, you were in love, and so was I. We really are alike, darling, Michelle said. I tell you what, so long as Arthur keeps this gone up, I'm doomed to stay on earth forever. Set me free. I watched as her hand reached through the mirror offering me a silver blade. Do it, she said. Oh, I will, I answered, taking the knife. But I can't do it alone. I waited about a week to confront him, waiting for the perfect time. Michelle and I had a plan. Arthur and I were getting ready for bed when Michelle appeared in my phone reflection and nodded. It was time. I discreetly uncovered the mirror as Arthur got into bed. What should we do tomorrow for dinner, darling? he asked. Oh, I don't know, I answered. Arthur. He looked up. Babe, what are you talking about? I think you know. And just like you know about Michelle. He laughed uncomfortably. How do you know about Michelle? I'm the one asking the questions here. Why did you kill her? He stared at me with cold eyes. All I wanted was a son, you know. And she couldn't give me one. Infertility, you know. One in five women. Crazy, right? So I thought, if she couldn't have kids, who would ever want her? Don't you see, I was doing her a favour. And afterwards, all I had to do was start going by my middle name and marry another woman. I mean, what were the odds I'd marry two barren ladies, you know? One of you had to have a child-bearing body. And now that you know, we can start a family together. Wouldn't that be nice, he said. No, I said, beckoning to Michelle. It wouldn't. I watched Arthur's eyes fill with fear as Michelle stepped out of the mirror, filling the room with the foul smell of rot. She limped towards Arthur as I sneakily pulled the silver blade out from my bra where I hid it. Arthur stood protectively in front of me. Don't worry, darling, she won't hurt you. I laughed. Oh, Arthur. Silly Arthur. Without a second thought, I plunged the blade directly into his back. As he crumbled in the ground in pain, I stood beside Michelle triumphantly. I know she won't hurt me. Again. Very good. Very, very well written story. I, um, I was sort of thinking, she's gonna get away with that, right? Because if he's already declared dead, isn't that double jeopardy? Is that what double jeopardy is? I feel like I've watched a movie called Double Jeopardy. Je double jeopardy. Where that's sort of what happens. You can't be charged with murder, murdering someone who's already declared dead. So, I don't know. But, yeah, that was definitely a good story. I'd like to see some of these, like, adapted into short films or something. Like, they honestly really good. There was one in the last video we did, which was just insane. But, uh, yeah, let's, uh, another good one. Let's keep it rolling and go on to story number three. So, story number three is a bit of a shorter one. It's called People Can't Recognize Me Anyone. Help, please. To elaborate, this all started five months ago. I set a meet up with my friends from college. We were gonna meet up at a bar just to catch up. 
they recognised me and knew who I was. Then a week later, when we set up to meet, I was taking an hour nap after work since we were meeting up at six and it was four. But I slept in on accident since my alarm didn't go off. So I hurried to get ready and rushed over to the bar. When I made it to the bar, I ended up being 20 minutes late. So when I ended, I walked up to them and apologised for being late. But that's when Tony, one of my friends, said, Who are you? Um, nice one, Tony, I said, thinking it was a joke. How did you know my name? We never once met you before, Tony said the others nodding in agreement. I'm your friend we met in college, remember? I said. No, we didn't. Whoever you are, you need to leave. I have proof we met, and plus I set this meet up. I said, taking out my phone to show them the texts. See, I set this up. That's just a reminder to, to you that you have the day of work, and plus you're not in our group chat. So you better leave before I get security, Tony said. So I left. And when I got home, I called my childhood friend, talking over video chat about what happened. And even they thought it was a prank, until we realised I wasn't in the group chat. So we both thought it was weird and just decided to say our goodbyes and go to sleep. Two months later, I went to give a surprise visit to my parents, but when I arrived, it happened again. I knocked on the door, and my mum answered and said, Who are you? Thinking they were joking, I said, Good one, mum. She instantly replied, With John, we have a stranger at our door saying they're our son. My dad soon came out with a bat, saying get off our property now. I replied, what do you mean I'm your son? He said, we don't have a son, we only have a daughter, so unless you have proof, get out now or I will call the cops. I instantly took my phone, scrolling through my family pics album to then see my parents not in there. So I promptly said, oh. Sorry, I confused with my parents. Your house and their house look similar. I am very sorry. My dad replied, Oh, okay, we get the confusion, but still, get out now. I replied with, yeah, sorry, bye now. After I left and got in my car, I called my parents' numbers to see what would happen. And all I heard was that the number doesn't exist. So I called my sister, and the same thing happened. They don't exist. Now it's today, and my childhood friend is starting to forget me. Her memories are fading of me, and my ID is starting to disappear. But me and my friend came up with an idea for her to remember me. But we have no idea how I can keep my identity. So to anyone reading this, please help me find out what's going on, because I think I'm running out of time. Pretty good. I mean, the first one says, someone has gone back in time and caused you not to be born. That's the only explanation. Interesting. Uh, not as scary as the other stories, but I think we've probably all had this, I was going to say, fantasy, it's not really the right word, like, nightmare scenario in our heads, like, imagining what would happen if everyone just forgot who you were, like, it is a horrible thing to think about, but, uh, unless, yeah, someone's going back in time and, and killing your younger self or whatever, then, uh, it's probably not gonna happen, so don't worry, everyone, I have spoken. Let's get on to story number four. Okay, so this is going to be the final story, and it's a long one, so get comfortable if you're not already, and strap in, because I've skimmed this and it looks like it, it could be a good one. It's titled, My Co-Workers Is 
hear something calling from the sea. It is killing them. These personal entries recorded by Redacted are intended for research purposes only. Entries unrelated to the event have been removed. All materials found here are the sole property of Eventide Petroleum and are not authorised for reproduction. If any unauthorised persons find themselves in possession of these documents, please contact the corporate office for a financial reward. August 10th, 2021. The jumpers always looked so happy as they marched to their death. You could see their faces clearly from the dozens of security cameras on the deck. Satisfied smiles covered their faces as they bounded carelessly toward the edge of the platform. We've installed a higher railing system around the edges, but it only made them work harder to get over the top. Before they jump, their arms extend out as though they expect something to come from the sky and scoop them up like a mother would pick up a small child. After one or two minutes of holding their crucifixion-like bows, they fall forward and sail through the air until they make an impact with the churning water below. Suicides on oil rigs aren't common, but they aren't unheard of either. The rate for oil extraction workers is nearly twice the percentage of males in the general population. At least that's what I read when I started researching this job. From what I've seen, it is drastically higher there, here. During my first month on the rig, I watched two men plummet to their death from the control room. Braxton and Gavin were their names. Happy guys as far as I could tell, wife, kids and nice houses to get back to after their rotations. Best job in the world, Braxton had told me the day we met. He pointed a finger out toward the endless blue waves that spread as far as we could see. No better view for that matter. It's almost like the ocean sings to you every night. Like it never wants you to leave. And he never did leave. Twenty days after we met, Earl Braxton and Jimmy Gavin leapt over the side of the rig during the night shift. Their bodies were never recovered. Skipping forward 18 nights to August 28th, 2021. We've lost three more men since I last had the chance to write. Derek Overden had only been on the rig for six days. Young guy, couldn't have been more than 22. It was his first offshore job and he had seemed so excited. He was a hard worker too. You ever hear anything weird when you're working out on the platform, he asked me one day. Sounds like there's someone out in a boat singing. No, I replied. I work down in control and keep an eye on the vital systems. Don't get outside as much as I should. I'm probably just hearing things. I try to ask a few of the other workers up top, but I guess they're too busy to talk. A few of them told me I should wear earplugs, but I don't know. The sound of the waves is soothing. The singing noise too, I kind of enjoy it. That was two days before he jumped. Our night shift crew wasn't fast enough to stop him. They never are. Toyo Hargrove was an old timer. He'd worked on Eventide rigs for over 30 years. According to the duty roster, he was due to rotate home next week. His psychological evaluation was top notch. No history of mental illness. All of his crew said nothing seemed out of place. If anything, he seemed happier than he had been in months. Just the same, Doyle threw himself over the side of the rig during the night shift. The third death wasn't a jumper. One of the motor hands, Alvy Spencer, was found standing near the edge of the platform, arms outstretched, looking towards the sky. Two roughnecks on the night shift saw him and managed to drag him back from the edge before he scaled the railing to fall into the drink. Alvy fought them to the nail as they pulled him toward the barracks. A few other men heard the commotion and came running to aid in the rescue. The motor hand punched and kicked everyone around him and scrambled to find a grip on the rig floor as they pulled him toward the bulkhead. The whole time he was just screaming the same thing over and over. Let me go. It's so beautiful. Just let me go.
Roger, at them secure Alby in an empty storage room while he radioed the mainland crew. They informed us they would send a helicopter to retrieve Alby and take him in for a mental health evaluation. We were all relieved to have finally saved one, but the celebration came too early. When we opened the storage room, Alby Spencer swung from his belt secured to a pipe. Poor bastard thought we'd managed to save one. September 20th, 2021 Shit just keeps getting more and more strange around here. There have been no more jumpers, which is great, but corporate has made some odd changes. Our old rig manager was replaced with some suit from corporate. He doesn't seem to have too much experience in the field. Has a strange way about him. Made a lot of changes too. Everyone he works outdoors on the rigs has to wear earplugs during the entire shift. No exceptions. It wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it's difficult to call someone over the loudspeakers with a lot of foam in their ears. Men have to work in two-man teams now, regardless of their position. If one goes to the bathroom, the other goes with them. They eat together, shower together. The only time you're away from them is when you go to bed. You even have to fill out a daily observation report about your partner. The questions are weird. You figure it would be a productivity thing, but it isn't like that at all. Has your partner exhibited any odd behaviour? Does your partner stare off into the distance frequently? Does your partner seem to hum or sing as they work? Have you noticed your partner spending too much time near the edge of the platform? There are also tons of signs posted everywhere on the rig saying we should report any strange thoughts or convulsions to our supervisor. No telling what kind of weird stuff those poor bastards are hearing from the crew. It's almost an open invitation for bad jokes. I'm not sure what the hell is going on here, but it may be time for a job change. My rotation is up on November 1st. It can't get here soon enough. October 17th, 2021. Working up on the deck has been a nice change of pace. We've been short on roughnecks lately and I accepted a pay bump to help out with grunt work. Steve, my partner, doesn't follow me around too much, which has been nice. We're both old timers and it wasn't too hard to work out an agreement to skirt a few of the new corporate rules. Those damn earplugs annoyed me too much, so mostly I just leave them out. N none of the young bucks on the crew say anything about it. Most of them have started keeping theirs out too. Not hard to manage. The suits from corporate stay inside in the air conditioning, giving us a free run of the place. I'm more relaxed than I've been in months. Braxton was right. The ocean does sing to you. Sometimes I close my eyes and it almost sounds like a woman. I can almost see her down below the rig, floating between the right white caps. She's beautiful. It's like... She's singing just for me. October 21st, 2021. Steve jumped from the platform yesterday. We were doing a security check on the railing system around the edge of the platform. They had been hastily installed as the incidents increased and the material wasn't holding up well against the salty sea spray. Bad news for the maintenance crew. Hey. Steve said to me as I was examining the bolts fastening the railing to the deck. I looked toward him and saw him pointing into the ocean. Look out there. Looks like a lady swimming in the water. It's fifteen miles to shore and there isn't a boat in sight, Steve. Your eyes are playing tricks on you. No, he stated, take a look for yourself. She's waving at us. I think I can hear her. Singing. I stood up and looked in the direction he pointed. At first I couldn't see anything, just the rolling blue waves. Then I saw her. Pale skin, dark hair, slender frame. She was bobbing up and down in the water. A long, thin arm waved above her head. She was too far away. 
way to make out any details of her face, but I couldn't help but think she would be the most beautiful woman I'd seen if I were a bit closer. A strange thought to have when you see a woman floating miles from the shore, but it haunted my mind. We've got to get someone out there to help, Steve said. Run up to the office and tell the rig manager we need to get out there to her. I ran as quickly as I could to the office and threw the door open like a bull in a china shop. It startled the men inside. Gasping for air, I told them there was a woman in the water and told them to follow me. We charged out of the office in the direction of Steve. By the time we returned, Steve was standing on top of the railing, arms outstretched. We shouted his name and ran toward him, but he never turned his head or acknowledged us. Just as we reached the bottom of the railing and began to climb up to retrieve him, he tilted over the edge and began to sail down. My guts were wrenched in horror. As Steve passed in front of my face, I caught a glimpse of his serene smile. And October 30th, 2021. The rescue crew never found Steve or the woman we saw in the water. I feel like I'm going mad. I'm scared. I hate it here. The music still fills my ears as I sit here on my bunk. Layers of steel walls and bulkheads can't drown it out. It's maddening but oddly beautiful. I wanted to stop, but I also don't. It would probably sound so much better if I could get a bit closer to it. I wonder if the woman Steve and I saw is the one singing. I wonder if she is as beautiful as I think she is. Maybe she's still down there. Maybe she needs help. I should help her. I'm going to go see if I can spot her. I'll just stand by the rail for a little while. Just for a minute. And there we have it. That was my co-workers. Here's something calling from the sea. We end with another very, very well-written story. I find the whole concept of sirens very scary. I know they're probably not real, but the whole mind control brainwashing thing kind of scares me a bit. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed. I think that one was probably my favourite one. You have to let me know what your favourite story out of the four was in the comments down below. But I think that is going to do it for tonight's video. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in and watching. I really hope you did enjoy. If you did enjoy this video then please give it a like and subscribe if you're new. But until the next video, everybody.